Welcome to the morning after edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 509. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's 12th of June, 2019. People, before we get started, as you probably know by now, you have a responsibility, and that's to like, share, comment, subscribe, do all those wonderful things to get the news that Anglican Unscripted is here to stay out to your friends, family, and clergy, and we're here to stay. I mean, 500 episodes, we've proven we're here to stay. We're not proving we're good, entertaining, anything like that, but we're here to stay. Uh, I have survived a long week. My son has graduated high school. Yay, going to college. My daughter got married. Oh, I had a birthday. Oh, boy. And so uh, this is going to be as casual it gets because I've been out of the news uh, for a whole 10 days. And so I'm going to rely heavily on Georgia and Gavin's might, memory, and that they've been in the news for... <laughs> if they haven't been newsmakers, they've been losing news participants and uh, listeners for the last uh, 10 days. Um I still got a champagne headache. It's what it is. So let's move on, guys. Uh, in the news, I see lots of stuff going around uh, that the Church of England feels it's an entity worth listening to, but they don't believe their message. And I thought that uh, we could talk kind of in regards to that and other issues. What now, do you why see going is that on news? I think that's been true for about 500 years, but yeah, I digress. Yeah. What, well, what's happened this week, Gavin? Well, the, Church of, well, the Church of England is embarrassed to be white. They're embarrassed to be <laughs> Christian. They're embarrassed to have a, a theology at all. Um, help us out, Gavin. Well, I think we're still in shock a little uh, at the Church of England's response to the propaganda campaign of the transgenderists, the mermaids. Mm -hmm. uh, another vicar, um, I'm afraid I don't have his name, but he passed me by on Twitter, uh, a brave man wrote to his local council, making the same point as John Parker, uh, I'm a school governor and I'm outraged by being closed down and by the propaganda of transgenderism for children. This is this is terrible. I, I, I can't be silent. So now we have two vicars out of 11,000 who have raised their heads above the parapets and of, of course to no great avail. And the, what we've seen is that the Church of England institutionally uh, led by Welby and his famous introduction to the booklet on transgenderism for schools is buying wholesale into the secular agenda to the great damage of uh, our children. Now, one of the one of the issues that we're facing, I think, is whether or not a church is willing to fight as a matter of, of principle or whether it's more concerned, I suppose, about what it would call relational integrity. And I had a bit of a surprise because I've I've been putting my toes in the waters outside Anglicanism uh, to, to see what would happen. So uh, just over the last 48 hours, I'm, I'm in Brighton. My old Is family. that why you're not wearing a collar? Yeah, yeah what's going yeah, on here? Yeah, I'm not thinking that. Roman Catholic, obviously Pentecostal or something. I, I didn't want to fight my, my, my Pentecostal house church. We call them house churches here. I don't know what okay. we call them in, in America, but it's the same. Uh, uh, but anyway, charismatic churches. And I'm with, they're just lovely people. I've known them for a long time. I respect them hugely. And I was surprised and delighted to get an invitation to take part in a debate before the eldership about homosexuality. Now, this is Brighton. So if you want to attract members in Brighton, you have to be, you have to take a very careful view on what you think about, about gayness and, and what Jesus taught about it. But of course, the Bible is fairly clear. So we had a debate and I presented the conservative biblical view. I have to say, I've, I've been reading Robert Gagnon and if anyone has time to watch Robert's videos, they're really very good. You learn a lot of, of wholesome Old and New Testament theology from Robert. It's, uh, it's excellent stuff. Um, but when it came to the presentation, there wasn't any question but that I was describing what was in the Bible and my opponent was, was presenting New Age secular values uh, to subvert Christian biblical teaching. What really shocked me was the way that, that the people we were talking to seemed to like what he was saying better than, than they liked what I was saying. And, and, and at the, at the end, uh, one, a strange thing happened that, that put into, uh, put, made real for me something that people have been talking about. So the first surprising thing was that three quarters of the audience were women. Now, they were very 
good women. I mean, the highest caliber. They were lovely people, clever, intelligent, holy, nice women. But as, as, as the cleverest and the nicest summed up, she said to my horror, you know, the thing is, Gavin, as a church, we're really very interested. We're more interested in process than we are in principle. We're more interested in the quality of our relationships than we are in having to make a choice between two uncomfortable truths. And I hope you understand that as we digest what you have said, we're going to do it through the filtration of those preoccupations. And Dama. Well, kind of. Now, for some time ago, uh, people said, you know, if you, if, if you find... So one has to be so difficult not to be, not to be genderist and uh, and prejudiced and you know the trouble with men is men can be very dry and, and over cerebral and over principled and aggressive. Of course they can, but but here there was a different context, and I was so surprised in in a Pentecostal charismatic context where biblical truth really ought to be taken for granted to be to find that I was fighting my way through a snowstorm of, 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 of still secular psychological feminism. And I thought, gosh, no, if it's, no wonder it's so bad in the Church of England if it's reached here like this. Well, George, the most male-dominated church on earth issued a transgendered report this week. What did they say? Well, the second most. I would say the Orthodox <laughs> yeah. are the most. <laughs> okay, you win. Collectively, the Orthodox. Uh, especially the fellows on Mount Athos. I think they've got that. that, that they do have that covered. too. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church issued a, issued a study document essentially rejecting gender theory, uh, the whole transgenderism, uh, as both being both uh, spiritually, biblically, psychologically, and scientifically fraudulent. Um, it was written in sort of church speak, anodyne, but it was really hard hitting statements that look, this, the sorts of things that John Parker in Essex and this other priest that Gavin mentioned in the north of England are fighting against, uh, Jules Gomez is fighting against, uh, Roger Scruton, uh, John, uh, John Peterson, John Peterson. Uh, this is not. In con this is not congruent with Christian doctrine and teaching. So the Roman Catholic Church is, now we always sort of assumed that they would say this, but they've actually addressed this and uh, issue head on. So kudos to the Catholic Church for taking an important stand. Now the difference in between taking a stand and following up on it, there will be Catholics, there are always going to be crazy nuns with us. We have a few <laughs> Episcopal crazy nuns, Kevin and I know well. Uh, <laughs> There'll always be those who do not conform to the magisterium's teaching. But uh, at least we've got uh, one of the major actors in the intellectual world taking a firm stand. Now, where's the Church of England on this? They have planted the flag squarely, whoever the middle might be. Uh, and right now for the middle for them is the uh, uh, semi-support of transgender doctrines and theology. Gavin, yeah, if I remember correctly, maybe it's three or four years ago, the BBC put together a documentary uh, on transgenderism and its effects on children and, uh, and the current curriculum that was being put out. That documentary was never published because it was so devastating to mm. the, the mermaid type uh, theology. And have we ever heard anything else about that documentary? No, uh, I mean it's 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 entirely the opposite. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are a few signs of organisations fighting back, like the Boy Scouts, um, mm -hmm. but but they're few and far between. Only in the UK, though, not in the United States. Yeah, not, not in the US. Right. Okay. Uh, so 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 no. Uh, I think the real dividing line at the moment is between uh, is this business about whether the church is going to speak prophetically to culture and say we have been given revelation by God, and you know you can benefit in this if, if you listen and repent, but otherwise you're going to be in trouble. But the problem is the voice of the Church of England seems, as I hear it, seems consistent the other way. I, I was following up some very complimentary stuff about a new Bishop of Lancaster, who is a uh, a very clever woman called Dr. Jill Duff. Uh, she's in her early 50s. She's got a PhD from Oxford in chemistry. Um, and she's been on YouTube and on television recently, so I, I thought I, I hadn't heard of her. I guess I've been out of things 
too long in that area. So I listened, and and um, she's certainly very competent and a very nice woman. Uh, but one of the things she was saying to the people who were listening to her was, we live in great times. There's been a sea change in culture. Uh, the culture we live in now is ready to listen to Christianity, and we're here ready to speak to it. So don't despair, it's getting better all the time. Now, she cited as an example, I think, two, two or three television programs which had uh, looked at Christian ideas or Christian themes, of which one was about her, which, which is nice. But I thought, I, I thought this was so far away from the world that I'm seeing uh, and the issues that we're dealing with that that I was really I was really surprised. I mean, I'm I'm seriously taken aback by it. I, I think it might be because I've I've heard it. I've heard the, such good news repeated down down the line. It might be just wishful thinking, but it doesn't seem to me to take into consideration uh, the very serious struggles for free speech, free thought, and the real antipathy to biblical values that our sexualized culture is exhibiting. Well, we have a cake maker who's just been sued for a third time here in Colorado um, because he's a Christian and he has values and morals that won't let him sell cakes uh, that have messages that he doesn't believe in. And we have the new Newsweek, a liberal rag here in America, admitting that the most persecuted religion in the world is Christianity. I don't see how Miss Duff gets her information other than something she writes for herself. I, where does this come from? Well, I think, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't, I mean, George suggested in an earlier conversation that she was saying uh, what a chief executive of a failing company would say if it was trying to stop its shareholders foreclosing on it. Uh, everything is absolutely fine, just gives a bit more time, it's going in the right direction. See, I, 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 uh, I don't know Gerald Duff. I know, she, I know her reputation. And I'm just coming to this discussion slightly different perspective. After having spent 20 years review, writing up bishops' addresses to the diocese and synods, I have seen bishops able to show how wonderful life is, even though attendance has fallen by 25%, we're bankrupt, we're being sued, the archdeacon has been arrested for pedophilia. Bishops had a wonderful ability to put a nice gloss or shine on failure. So I... Maybe I'm just a little jaundiced, but I'm not particularly perturbed by somebody trying to paint a rosy picture in a dismal situation. The question is, does she really believe it? And if she, and what is she going to is she what is she going to do about this well, belief? It may, it may too be an example of T.S. Eliot's great phrase: "Humankind cannot bear very much reality." I was surprised last night at um, in in the in the company of people I really admire and like at, at the at the speed with which they began to seem willing to shoot the messenger rather than listen to the message. I mean, one of the things that I, I was saying is if you accept the the arguments in favor of same-sex marriage and the integrity of same-sex relationships, which are essentially, I was born this way, I can't help it, I'm a victim of who I am, don't deprive me of love, I feel love and attraction and I want to express it romantically and sexually, there's nothing to stop you moving that through into incest or pedophilia. And although incest isn't really taking hold in any particular way, there are people pushing paedophilia quite hard behind the scenes as one of the next developments in the ungluing of Judeo-Christian culture. Now, when I said this, one or two people were extremely uncomfortable and then they got very angry and they said, how, one, one person said, I, a man, as it happened, I can't leave the room without expressing my profoundest objection to you linking together homosexuality and paedophilia. And I said, well, if you don't like it, then go and save the children from the consequences of the argument. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, but don't shoot me for telling you about it. Um, I, I think that the problem is we are in very difficult times and the consequences of accepting Christian values in the face of a culture which doesn't like us uh, doing it and is, is angry with us and, and will punish us for doing it, they will require a, a courage and integrity from people who want to follow Jesus. In the end, I found myself saying to some of these people, listen, Buddhists have no problem with this stuff. If you, if you don't like the Christian message, be a Buddhist and relax, but, but don't try and change the Christian message to accommodate you're wanting to be at peace with a society that's promoting very different values. If, if I may take up a point that Gavin just mentioned, uh, 
uh, as I've mentioned in the past, in my misspent youth long time ago, I, in college I studied Persian. That was my minor, as they would say in America. And I knew a great deal about uh, Shia Islam. Transgenderism is not a big issue in Shia Islam. Mm. Uh, if you, there's an organization called MEMRI, M -E -M -R -I, Middle East Monitoring and Reporting Institute. They translate Arab and Persian and Urdu language uh, articles into English. And the, there have been a number of fatwas or uh, authoritative statements coming out of Iran where they've actually been discussing the whole transgenderism issue, and they say it is good for a woman to want to be a man. That it, because if a woman wants to be a man, she's aspiring to be a better thing. And we should allow her to do <laughs> this. Do that? <laughs> because no, because the Muslim worldview, women are mm -hmm. sinks of sin and temptation, mm -hmm. and a woman who wishes to, it's a lot. It follows logically from covering up a woman's face and her hair to covering up her sexuality by transforming mm -hmm. it either into asexuality or into maleness. Mm -hmm. And we don't we. Sometimes in the West, we assume that the world as a whole assumes that our Christian background or natural law teachings are universally held truths and propositions. Mm -hmm. They're not. So the arguments that we're having, a little Anglican thing, there's a little uh, flap in the Church of South India. In India, there have always been a caste, a group of people, hijra, uh, men that dress as women. Uh, they're, prim uh, they're kicked out of their families. Uh, uh, they form distinctive castes of prostitutes in the major cities, and it's part of the Indian age-old tradition. They're beloved by Western sociologists who like to explore anything exotic and sexual in foreign cultures. Well, the Church of South India's uh, flagship college has now set aside places for students who are men dressing as women. And the church in, in South India is now patting itself on the back, saying, aren't we being progressive and Christian in, well, the, the arguments are we're helping these poor people escape persecution, but we're celebrating who they truly are. And this idea of who they truly are as a Christian is I think we're Gavin and Kevin. I know you're. We're all coming down on saying no. That's not who you truly are. This whole transgenderism is trying to change whom God made you into, into whatever society or your current uh, worldview tells you you are. And, and so we're the, back to our Kevin. Well, that's the big thing here. You know, Gavin's saying that you know the Bible speaks against it. Well, it's not just the Bible. It's, it's science. It's medicine. It's anthropology, it's history, it's tradition, it's reason, it's logic, um, it's every you know everything we know as a human society speaks against transgenderism and speaks against homosexual relationships. This, the, not, you know, it's not just scripture. Well, Kevin, I, I do want to pick up this point because here's one of the difficulties that I guess the three of us have coming from a certain generation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, just put out a study saying there is no uh, bio there's no evidence from biology that homosexuality uh, orientation is innate. Correct. All of the evidence that they have been able to uncover, and Johns Hopkins is one of the premier medical schools, research facilities in the United States. It's not innate, it's learned behavior. They were the first center to offer uh, sex change operations. Yeah. And now they no longer do it uh, yeah. because and so so we have if you will that fact set and then i happened to be watching flipping through the tv the other night and i came across bill maher who's a, a comedian and he's very very liberal but he's either he's i enjoy watching him he has a very sharp mind and he was happened to be talking about the politics and he was talking about hillary, hillary clinton and he mentioned oh yes it's quite uh, quite obvious that she She's far more guilty of obstructing justice than Donald Trump ever was, but then, comma, facts don't matter. And his th the, the gist of his argument is that at the end of the day, we no longer live in a world where science matters, uh, where, where facts matter, where logical argument matters. So Jill Duff can hmm. propose a worldview that everything is hunky-dory and rosy and it's just lovely, uh, and damn the facts because they don't matter i think that's so important we're back to to to, to my 
my chairs and hosts last night saying we want good process good relationships rather than principle there was one very interesting moment when um, <clears throat> a few people said we don't want any talk of gays being healed praying out the gay let let people be who they are and who they they've been made to be and i said well I said, you know Peter Tatchell, right? I mean, Peter Tatchell's one of my heroes, actually. I think he's a man of immense moral courage and caliber. I don't agree with, with of course, with his uh, spearheading gay rights, but, but uh, one of the things that Peter Tatchell has said is uh, gays can change. And this happened because his, his greatest friend as part of the gay community uh, suddenly met a woman aged 35. He fell in love with her married her, had children, and has never looked back and is immensely happy. And Peter Tatchell, who is an honest man, says, well, if this can happen to somebody I wrote really, really well, then it's not as fixed as, as some of our people have been saying. So well, it's only an anecdote. When I said this story, people were profoundly uncomfortable with it because it was a fact that they didn't want to take on board if it required them to make what you might call a binary choice of principle. And, and so that's the issue. We live in a culture which is now feelings-based, frightened of facts, and is very anxious to promote, by almost any means, artificial or not, uh, cozy, nice relationships. And when Christianity f falls into, into a religion of the nice, it ceases to be what Jesus made it. And, and we're, we're, this is not new. Living in a world defined by myth is how the communist world survived for almost a hundred years. It's why, why Hitler was so inordinately popular. People are so possessed by what they wish things to be that they will buy into a myth that has no basis in real life. And they prefer that to the reality. And the, the strength and the problem of Christianity, it is not a myth, it's reality. It's the ultimate reality, and people throughout history have been fighting against that reality. Uh, you know, you could go back and take it from opposite corners, where there was a long tradition among some southern theologians in the United States and in South Africa that black people, because they're descendants of the ill-favored son of uh, Noah, Therefore, must be hewers of wood and carriers of water for whites and Asians. And this mythology of what racial superiority, mythology of cultural superiority, uh, is so, it, it's what empowers people to get out of the trenches and charge the enemy. And, and it applies to us too. One of the things I'm more and more struck by as I go on being a Christian is the way uncomfortable elements of my own personal reality get exposed to me by the Holy Spirit through Jesus and require me to make another, another one of a constant series of choices of surrender when I'm presented with something I don't want to know about and I'd rather not see. In other words, we're not just telling other people that they need to make difficult choices. It is built into being a Christian that it happens to all of us as God changes us from the disordered, broken, complex, difficult people that we are into something more like Jesus. But you have to, you know, which is why if you want to follow after me, you have to pick up your cross because it's going to involve a, 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 a constant defeat of the ego. Kevin, if I may jump on something, and Kevin, shut me down if I go too far down a rat hole. Uh, many of time, commenters on the YouTube and other uh, other platforms where we share this will say, okay, fellas, you've put forward a wonderful uh, argument. Now, how do we, people in the world, live that out? What can we do? We agree with everything that you say, but, you know, at this point, how does this change from a conversation down at the down at the pub? Yeah, what, can, how, what can somebody do in, if they're in this world? We read the Bible and we say our prayers and we make ourselves accountable to one another. And by these means, we we enter into the more deeply into the process that that the Holy Spirit brings. I've just spent only forty eight hours in a monastery, but I'm always profoundly struck at the at, at the quality of the monks. Now, all the, I say all these monks do, and what these monks do is they say their prayers and they listen to the Bible and they and they offer God their egos, and and they are workshops of transformation. They 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 have something about them that is undoubtedly more 
uh, more profound. Now, of course, what this is doing is buying into what used to be called the, 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 the medieval Catholic view of the superior superiority of the pious. But I have to say, when I see people who have given over their lives and their time and their energies and their will to saying their prayers and immersing themselves in scripture and humility, it produces a different kind of person. I'm very impressed. And one of the most terrible things that we did in England was to destroy the monasteries and the houses of prayer and the capacity of people to give themselves to this transformation process. I got to jump back at you, Gavin, because this ties in. In our parish, we've been, uh, in our adult education, we've been working through Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life together, the time of his community in Finkenwald, the underground seminary. And uh, in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, when the uh, Christianity, real Christianity was an all intents uh, made criminal. And one of the and what Bonhoeffer insisted on was starting the morning and ending the day with prayer, then contemplation of scripture. Yeah. And the uh, students were quite chuffed about this because you know we here we want to take a Christian stand against Nazism, and the the leaders who had sent these young men to be prepared to be pastors were saying, look, we want you to turn out fiery orators who can beat the Nazis at their own game. And Bonhoeffer's response is that you miss the whole point of Christianity. We're not agitators. We're not uh, uh, mm. orators. We're Bible people. And that Bible form, and if we don't form ourselves in the morning and at night in his context, and so it's not, not something that we lost with the monastics, uh, but, so, uh, but we see it glimpses here and there in Christian community and fellowship in the world today. Cran Cranmer, if I may just quickly say so, the one that people don't often know that one of the things Cranmer intended was, was following the death of the monasteries. He wanted the Book of Common Prayer to be the backbone of a new lay monastic movement so that the, 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 the people of the parish around their priest would greet the morning and greet the evening with prayer and with this great diet of scripture. My goodness, if you follow the Book of Common Prayer's lectionary, you, you go through the Book of Psalms with with an astonishing regularity real uh, serious undiluted anglicanism as cranmer conceived it was as close to the monastic rhythm of formation under the word of god and giving time to the holy spirit in prayer as you could want to be outside a monastery i'm not suggesting people need to become monks but i'm suggesting that they give us an example that helps us pursue the process of transformation that lies at the heart of being a christian and i think that's kind of the important thing. We have to take the step back and look at the big picture. The small picture is always wrong. The big picture is not to take um, a gay person and make them straight or take a transgender and, and make them binary. It's to take the lost and make them saved and let the Holy Spirit do all the rest. Let the Holy Spirit be the enlightener. Let the Holy Spirit be the convictor of sin. And we always lose ourselves in that process because we know the rules. And um, how does that work? Through worship, through prayer, through study, mm -hmm. through um, being there uh, for your friends and with your friends. Uh, back to Jill Duff's comments. Um, right now, people are in prison in China because they're Christian. Mm -hmm. They're memorizing scripture because they have no access to Bibles anymore. Uh, China's so bad that they're they're... Uh, putting Muslims in uh, concentration camps. It's, it's not just uh, uh, taking down the Christians. There is persecution going on uh, around the world, and we need to stop being blinders to what we don't want to see. That's the big picture stuff. And uh, let's get back in the weeds again, and Hong Kong is about to fall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, where yeah. Hong Kong had, China does not have a working justice system, doesn't have, it, you know, it's entirely political. The state can press any charge against it against you at once, and you will be found guilty. Hong Kong had a separate legal system, and now China is seeking to absorb that and allow people. Essentially, democracy activists can be arrested in Hong Kong for, for, for speech violations and tried and imprisoned in China. Actually, and guess and guess which side? And the and the and over a million people and fifteen million people live in Hong Kong. A million people were in the streets this weekend protesting this law, which the pro, which the communist appointed legislature passed. Guess which side the Anglican Church was on? 
no, don't tell me. Yes, the head of the Anglican Consultative Council has been an opponent of the free speech movement. So the, the head, uh, the, if you will, the elected head of the ACC has uh, given his blessings, and then by implication, the Anglican blessings, Anglican blessings to uh, the uh, communists in Peking. Well, no wonder where and, 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 and where and where they've even withdrawn affiliation from the ecumenical Protestant seminary because the seminary has been protesting the arrest of students for speech violations, and the Anglicans uh, didn't want to be associated with those protests. Okay, I need to close up here because Gavin has an appointment to get to. We promised him two hours ago he'd be done in 50 minutes. And, uh, well, the Holy Spirit's taken us a lot longer in this process, but that's the way it works. That's the big picture. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton. And I did promise you, George, I'd speak more quickly and not so much as my own fault. You've been listening patiently to Anglican Unscripted 507 on the 12th of June, 2019.